It's a great uh, blessing to be able to worship you with you. I was thinking about, I'm starting my ninth year at Gordon. Rebecca and I came to a chapel service when we uh, had been selected by the search committee, but not yet ratified by the full board of trustees. We snuck in and sat in the balcony and observed the worship of the community. And I just have to say, it's a great encouragement to be gathered with uh, so many of you, uniting your hearts in wanting to honor the Lord. You inspire me and encourage me. So it's a great privilege to serve uh, with you. And I'm grateful for all that you bring to the campus. This morning, I want to share a, a personal story of a journey I've had in recent months. This morning's sermon began with a text message that I got this summer. It said, I really cannot describe this pain. It's all completely wrong. My younger boys will begin fifth and ninth grades tomorrow. It's now time for me to pull up my bootstraps and get to work. Riley was incredibly strong today. And I am so proud. But I am also devastated. This was a text message from the wife of one of my childhood friends. Who that day had, uh, had a very significant change of his life. He had been an executive pastor of a large church uh, close to our hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. But that day he had been uh, sentenced to serve a five-year prison term. My friend Riley, you see, had been indicted by a grand jury for embezzlement. He claims to be innocent, but the proof of his innocence was written down in a notebook that was in his office that was somehow removed from his office right after he was fired from his job, but before he could go in and clear out his office himself. He had no evidence of his innocence, so as a result, he took a plea deal with the district attorney, one in which he did not accept guilt, but he also did not contest the charge. Now, this is a guy that I've known since first grade. We went to church youth group together. We graduated high school together. We've been friends ever since. A couple summers ago, he brought his wife and kids to Gordon so they could get a chance to visit the campus. That was before everything hit the fan and his life changed forever. Now, I don't know if you've ever had any personal contact with the criminal justice system, but let me just say, it's not the place you go where you're looking for really exemplary customer service. As I tried to figure out a way to send him a letter, or even to find out where he was being held in a series of different sort of temporary locations, I got an endless series of runarounds and bad information. And because many of our prosecutors in this country are elected to their office, there's a lot of politics in who gets tried and who quite literally gets away with murder. Riley got the bad end of a series of difficult blows and it's left scars on his life and his family's life that will be with them forever. I'm not here to defend my friend's honor, but I do actually believe him. I think he's been unjustly treated, in part because a district attorney was trying to advance his political career, in part because a church was looking for an easy scapegoat instead of the right resolution, and in part because we live in a very broken world, where despite our best efforts, bad things still happen. It's in this context that Psalm 86, the psalm that Jordan read, became very meaningful to me. John Piper reminds us that the psalms, we read them to learn about God, to learn about humanity, and to learn about how we might relate to God. This particular psalm is a psalm of David that we believe he wrote when he was being persecuted by Saul. There are three basic sections of the psalm. Verses 1 to 7 are basically an entreaty to God, a sustained supplication. Verses 8 to 13 is where he moves into sort of a hymn of praise to God. And then verses 9, uh, 14 to 17 pick back up this earlier supplication of God, I hope that you will intervene. The psalm begins with the following statement. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, O Lord, for I put my trust in you. In this opening section of the psalm, David reveals a whole lot about his given situation. He says that he is poor and needy, and yet he trusts in God to meet all of his needs. The whole psalm is actually kind of like a, a two-part melody where you have 
a, a melody and a counter melody that harmonize together. The melody is where David directly appeals to God, that God would intervene. He says, hear me, answer me, guard my life, save me, have mercy on me, teach me, give me, turn to me. These are the supplications that come very naturally for David. And truthfully, they come easy for all of us. I've always found it easy to pray those personal supplications to God. I may not find myself being pursued as David was pursued by Saul, but I often, oftentimes find myself praying in much the same way that David prays here. Answer me, O oh God, on whether Boston is the right place for us to move. If this is the right job for us to take. Save me, Lord God, for my enemies are seeking to embarrass me, to run me out of town, to ruin my life and reputation. Teach me, God, of how I ought to respond to this situation, how I ought to respond to what Rebecca has said, or how the girls have acted. Give me, O oh God, a positive break, just, a, just one lucky break, God, a way in which the situation will get better. Turn to us, O oh God, and heal our child. Turn to us and lift our head from this dark place. These are all melodies that I have sung to God over the course of my life. They come naturally for me and frankly for all of us. But Psalm 86 also puts forward what we might call a counter melody. A counter melody is, is different from a, a harmony sung by someone because a counter melody has its own independent music. A distinct melodic line of its own. It's not secondary or subordinate trying to harmonize in. Instead, the two work together. The melody and the counter melody work together for a fuller, richer sound. And so it must be in our prayer life. You see, if you begin to look at the counter melody of Psalm 86, you see that there's 17 different times that David makes reference to God. And there are at least 11 different things that we learn about God from this particular psalm. We hear from, God, from David that God is forgiving and good, that God is abounding in love, that God is slow to anger, that God is unique, incomparable in deeds, that God is great and great is his love. He's delivered us from the depths, from the realm of the dead. He's a compassionate and gracious God. He's the one who helps and comforts us. You see, for all of our foibles and failings, God is the faithful one who fills all of the gaps. Cassiodorus was a 6th century uh, Roman writer who reminds us that we come to know God as someone entirely different from us, holy and set apart, so really, really different from us, but also powerful enough to do anything and everything, the one who actually wants to act on behalf of his children. For millennia, we've been studying the Psalms because they teach us how to pray, or at least how we ought to pray. It's certainly the case that we're to bring the longing of our heart, the challenges in our life before the Lord. That's the melody we sing. But a, a fruitful and rich prayer life is a whole lot more than us just bringing a laundry list of requests before the Lord. It involves an ongoing heart conversation with the Lord. Where we remind ourselves that all God is and all that God can do. Because the Psalms teach us about the nature of God. On this side of heaven, there's a lot of trials and tribulations that we're going to experience. But we can be assured of this as well. Ours is a trustworthy God. One who can meet all of our needs. He's done it in the past. And he's doing it this very day. In this particular psalm, David refers to God as master seven different times. The psalm is really written more like a royal letter addressed to God. Between a vassal ruler addressing his lord. We see that David places his relationship with God at the very center of that interaction and to his identity. Which begs the question that we all have to ask ourselves as we stand underneath the psalm. What is at the center of our own identity? Who is the orienting or what is the orienting principle of our lives? The psalms remind us that it should be God. Over the last couple of years, I have found myself in a prison of sorts, one of my own making. I wouldn't have called it that, but through a series of circumstances somewhat beyond my control, and then a series of subsequent self-reflections that probably were within my control, I began to descend into a place of 
deep confinement. Perhaps you or someone you love has experienced something similar. I found myself going around the house muttering a whole lot more than I used to. Getting angry and frustrated in conversations that would replay in my head. Anger wasn't so much the problem, it was just the symptom of a much deeper problem that was going on in my life. What started off as self-doubt and external critique became a form of what I think we probably ought to call self-loathing. Alluding to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans when he says, What I want to do, I don't do, but I do the very thing that I hate. I've become persuaded that our minds are very important gateways to our souls. We have to nurture them and guard them so that we can live the life that really is life, as Scripture says. After taking stock of my life over the summer, I decided to adopt Psalm 86.4 as my theme verse for this particular year. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. The two things are held in tandem, the melody and the countermelody. Lord, I need some joy as I put my trust in you, for you are a trustworthy God. This verse became really important to me as I was thinking about my friend Riley, who was going through a very difficult season. As I had another very dear friend uh, whose wife walked out on him and left him with two young boys to care for himself, and some of my own experiences. See, even though I have tremendous blessings, uh, a godly and beautiful wife whom I love, children whom I adore and am very proud of, significant work and a meaningful calling on my life, despite all of those things, I would say a significant portion of my life have become, well, joyless, I guess. These are challenging days, not just for a school like Gordon, but frankly for Christian influence in our society. The snarkiness of social media and the cynicism of so many can really put wounds on your heart in ways you couldn't imagine. It can sap the joy right out of you. Add to that the suspicion and the slander that so easily hangs over Christian communities. And you can easily feel like you've fallen into a very dark well. That's certainly been part of my journey. And yet I came to realize that even the smallest light can pierce the deepest darkness. The gentle words of an encouraging email from a student can, in the hands of God, become the answer to an unspoken prayer. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, David writes in verse 5, abounding in love to all who call to you. He continues in verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I became convinced by late July or August of this year that we as a community needed to pray that we would have an undivided heart. The Bible speaks of there being an enemy who seeks to devour Christian community like a roaring lion. The devil most often often accomplishes this through division and gossip, a problem that a group of student leaders identified in a survey we conducted in August, where they have said that one of the biggest problems we have at Gordon is gossip. That's why I think we need to pray that the Lord will give us a spirit of unity and contrite hearts that would not allow us to speak ill of one another. You see, the sin that is crouching at the door is cynicism and contempt, but we do not have to let that in. The God that David describes in Psalm 86 is a strong, victorious God. One who can hold at bay the schemes of the devil. It's important for us to focus on the one who can solve our problem and not focus so much on the problems that we face. My colleague Paul Edwards oftentimes likes to remind those of us on cabinet that really what we need to do is, is not gaze at our problems and then just occasionally glance at God, but instead turn it around and we fix our gaze on God and occasionally glance at our problems. That's the point of the counter melody in Psalm 86. 
When you spend all your time rehearsing only the melody, you forget all of the good news of the counter melody. We do have real problems. Deep darkness. Evil that exists. And yet, we have a God who is the answer to all of those problems. And he is here this morning wanting to do business with us. While grappling with some of these challenges and ideas over the summer, I came and sat in this very room, sat about two-thirds of the way back, and attended the memorial service for our beloved Rich Obenchain, the founder of Levito. There was a quote that was in the program of Rich's memorial service. It's by the New England author and pastor, Frederick Beekner. I liked it so much that I cut it out and I taped it and put it on my computer monitor to remind me of its wisdom. Beekner wrote, even the saddest things can become, once we have made peace with them, a source of wisdom and strength for the journey that still lies ahead. Even the saddest things can become, once we've made peace with them, a source of wisdom and strength for the journey that still lies ahead. That's a word of redemption. Rich taught us all the value of commitment moves. Those decisions that we make to step out in faith, which come to define who we are as followers of Christ. Each of you made a commitment move in deciding to come to Gordon. It was a big decision. And you are a different person because you are here in this season at this time. You may marry a different person because you came to Gordon. You will certainly experience different things because you came to Gordon. You will be a different person for the rest of your life because of that one commitment move that you have made. But in God's gracious providence, he decided that he needed you here in this season for this time. So what is it that the Lord wants to do in and through you in our community? Could it be that you are the agent of reconciliation the Lord wants to use today? We're not a perfect campus, far from it. But we endeavor to be a place where you can make significant commitment moves that move you along in your journey of faith. And that in God's great providence, each of those commitment moves being made wherever you are can help us to be a community that is more fully aligned with the purposes of God. To be actively involved in the mission of God. So what is it this morning that you want to ask of the Lord? We sang songs here we want the Lord's presence to be here. And he is here. So what is the business you need to do with him today? You see, this morning as we sit comfortably in these pews, there are people all around the world who, like my friend Riley, are sitting in a jail cell. I wonder what is on Riley's mind at this morning. How he's processing all the things that have happened over the last three months. This summer I was reminded of the wisdom that came from Eugene Peterson in a book he wrote on the book of Jonah called Under the Unpredictable Plant. The title, of course, comes from the fourth chapter of Jonah, where you remember that God caused a plant to grow up and to provide a degree of shade over Jonah for a day. But then God also brought a worm along to eat that plant so that it withered and the shade dissipated. As the plant withered and the scorching sun was overhead, it became unbearable for Jonah. He became so angry that he says he wishes he were dead. Of course, the plant is just a prop in God's grander narrative of trying to work and teach Jonah. In just four short chapters of that book, we see that God uses us and shapes us in our most teachable moments. And those almost always come in moments of deep confinement, when we are least comfortable. Seasons of great confinement and of challenge, Peterson reminds us, can also become moments of great clarity. For Jonah, it took the belly of a whale. It's interesting because in some cultures, this actually became axiomatic of how you could know that you were in the presence of God. In Eastern Europe, there's a tradition whereby the pulpits that preachers would preach from were fashioned in the, the shape of a whale that was standing up right. The preacher, the, the preacher would climb into the pulpit and go through a, a set of stairs that went directly through the belly. 
and come out and preach to the community from an open mouth where the pastor would deliver the sermon. It was a visible reminder throughout Eastern Europe that God's message penetrates the most when we are most attentive. And sometimes that comes in the belly of the fish. I don't know what's going on in your life this morning. What sadness you are feeling because of loss or hurt or pain. But my hunch is that all of us can relate to the feeling of Jonah and of David in terms of feeling moments of great challenge and confinement. It may only be a prison of our own making, but it may be a place of darkness, a place without joy, a place of fear or guilt or sadness. The good news, friends, is that this is also a place where we can meet God. The transformative news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we have a God who does not leave us alone in the belly of a whale. As we put our trust in God, he brings joy to his servants. As verse 5 declares, Ours is a God who is forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on him. Nehemiah 8 reminds us the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we claim that as we go forth from this place. Corrie ten Boom hid Jews from arrest and deportation during the German occupation of her hometown of Harlem in the Netherlands. She did it out of a, a feeling of deep Christian conviction, but was eventually caught by the authorities. For her actions, she was imprisoned, sent to a concentration camp, and lost members of her own family at the hands of the Nazis in the waning days of World War II. Her autobiography, The Hiding Place, should be required reading for every Christ follower because it's a story of great moral courage in pursuit of both justice and mercy. She was a woman who took action, but she also recognized that there are limits to what we, she could do. She wrote, When we are powerless to do a thing, it is a very great joy that we come and step inside the ability of Jesus. This morning we're reminded of the melody and the counter-melody that God's people have sung for thousands of years. Each of us come this morning with needs that we want the Lord to meet. I'm here to remind you that ours is a great God, one who can take us out of that dark place and who can lift us up. The joy of the Lord truly can be our strength. The way of Jesus is not a place of continuous happiness or easy living. It's a journey of discipleship, of putting to death the sin that so easily entangles, and of opening ourselves up to a place of obedience and righteousness, even when it goes against the flow. So my prayer for you this morning is that whatever challenge or confinement you may be feeling, that that also will become the crucible of your own transformation, the very place where God meets you and changes you for godly good. May you really attend to God's word in whatever he has to say. We pray the Psalms because they help us to sing the melody and counter melody that connects us with the very heart of God. Bring joy to your servants, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. Let's pray. We pause this morning, God, because we know that you are a God who is at work in the world. Even as we sit here and think about our own problems and things to do, you are doing amazing things on this planet to bring more people to the reconciling love of Jesus Christ. We pray that we would be your agents of reconciliation. May we be a community that doesn't fall into the pits of cynicism or suspicion. May we not be a place that is divided or a place that wallows in the pit of gossip. Instead, Father, we pray that no unwholesome talk would come out of our mouth, that we could hold one another accountable in a godly, gracious, and loving way that helps us to sing both the melody and the countermelody of the goodness of God. Bring joy to your servant, O oh Lord, as we put trust in you. And now, O oh Lord, may the God of hope fill us with joy and peace 
as we put our trust in you so that we might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May that be true for us this day in this place, having encountered your word for us. This we pray in the strong name of Christ our Savior. Amen. God bless you all.